uh see uh, we started with a general understanding of international law just giving you a, the backdrop which you will anyway see in the recorded lectures um <clears throat> just a general understanding as to what is international law you know what is its nature what are the basis certain jurisprudential understanding with respect to understanding international law from the perspective of positive law or understanding international law from the perspective of natural law right historical development certain historical development also and in the process we have also tried to understand uh, the type of questions asked by upsc right then uh, from there we also then moved on to what are the basis of international law basically a general understanding of international law so as to lay down the platform uh, for further discussions or rather for further specific topics so after completing the generality of international law uh we then move to this very specific and very important part sources of international law as you can see uh if at all a question is asked with respect to sources of international law we have to start with this particular article from statute of international court of justice and so far i think we have discussed uh, most of it today we'll be discussing about some case laws today and tomorrow and then from there on we'll move to general principles of law recognized by civilized nations so that has been done so far right and uh, i was i'm i'm also uh, giving certain assignments in the class basically uh, to make you understand as to how to write the answers and all okay okay so so i'll go through the recorded lectures mm -hmm. and whatever those questions will be i'll write those and i'll share with you yeah absolutely just go through i, I, I think uh, and one more information for all of you guys i think uh, this has also been told uh, to you by the management that uh, the videos are available only matlab from the day it is uploaded till the next month it's available right so try to watch that the earlier videos as soon as yes. possible as far as the handout is concerned don't worry for that that is anyways available okay so from uh, statute of icjc we have already discussed about Uh, in detail about customary international law but uh, yesterday when we were talking about customary international law certain doubts emerged uh, with respect to which has more weightage customary international law comprises of two parts actual state practices or state practices and opinio juris Suraj, do you understand opinio juris? Uh, yes, sir. We had it in the demo classes. You told us about that. Okay, okay. You and uh, are you a law law student? Or uh, are you uh, a law yes. graduate? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Just asking in case because uh, there are I think two students who are not uh, non law graduate students. So okay. uh, the idea is to make them also understand. You know, if I am using certain legal principles or certain legal terms, I am sure which is fine by you, but. uh for them they may not be able to understand so the idea is to make it as simple as possible so yeah opinio juris is that states believe or uh actually it's based on their belief or their intention that whatever states practices are there they are legally bound by those state practices so this is the basic and a very simple meaning of opinio juris and when these two combine together we have customary international law so the question uh, which we delved into detail was which has more weightage this has more weightage or this has more weightage now it's very difficult to uh, ascertain it's very difficult to say exactly or precisely that any actual practices uh, has more weightage or opinio juris has more weightage because that because obviously customary international law is always in the form of you know it's never a, it's not a static concept it's a dynamic concept things are changing every day international law particularly with respect to customary international law things are changing every day and even this aspect has been highlighted by international law commission so uh, in having uh, said this that it's a dynamic concept so state practices suppose this is a certain state practices for certain behavior or certain norms but what happens is that suppose there is a change in some state practice and there is a deviation that states are not practicing this but state starts practicing a different course of action 
let's say 100 states were practicing or following this straight line of certain norm or certain behavior. And out of this, say 60 states started following this new line of behavior. And of these 60 states, 30 states, I'm sorry, out of these 100 states, 30 states did not protest. And only five states were persistently opposing earlier also. They were not following these five states earlier also. They were not following these straight, this norm of behavior, which is represented through a straight line. They were earlier also not following. They were persistently objecting. And they were also objecting this new course of action. So question arises on whom will this new course of action be? legally applicable under international law based on customary international practices. So uh, considering these 30 states who did not protest. So in a way, this is refers, referred as acquiescence or tacit agreement or tacit implied consent. That, okay, we don't have any problem. You follow a new path, fine, fine with us. But so this new path will be and these did not protest also suggested that in certain way they consented to this new or changed state practice. Okay. So they consented also. They did not protest. So it was also believed that they believed, these 30 states believed, even by not protesting, that they were legally bound. But... For those five states who were persistent objectors, this new customary law or this new norm of behavior under customary law will not be applied. You understanding this, Suraj? Yes, sir. So this is what we were discussing yesterday. So today, uh, and uh, see, when we talk about customary international law, it's very difficult to prove anything. And everything will depend on case to case basis. Because as such, there is no straight jacket chain formula ki hai, uh, this much percentage, this has to be there, that 20% of opinion jurists has to be there and a, a mixture of it will cons constitute customary international law or uh, customary international practices considered as legally binding under international law. There is no such written rule per se. Rules are subject to, uh, you know, different cases. Rules are subject to the opinion of jurist if those cases are uh, go to the International Court of Justice for dispute. Uh, Man is here. Man, you asked me to go through Yus Kojins and uh, Arga Omnis, right? Am I audible, Man? Yeah, so I uh, started going through that and uh, I found that there are certain, uh, even legal scholars are not very clear, although they agree to the fact that both are almost similar, but with respect to any difference at all, uh, let me go through more documents so that we can have a concrete answer. Suppose tomorrow a question is actually asked uh, regarding the difference, if there is any difference at all between Erga Omnis or um, Uskogens. And uh, Erga Omnis basically started with Barcelona, Barcelona traction case, where it was considered that it is the, it is, it is the obligation of states to towards the community as a whole. So the whole idea, although it appears to be the same thing, but the idea is slightly different with, with respect to the use cogent norms, which are considered certain, uh, you know, pre per entry norm from which derogation is not allowed more or less the same thing. Yes, but okay. I'll see. I have, when I was going through some of the documents, some of the actually articles published online. So, uh, they they mentioned one point that is use cogents only a negative concept or can it also include a positive concept? And uh, let me go through the recommendations of International Law Commission also with respect to use cogents. And uh, I hope I'll be able to find something concrete so that we can have at least, you know, something to write in case a question is asked, asked uh, at least a 10 or 15 marker topic. So uh, let me check. Let me give me some more time so that I can go through it concretely. So that we don't have a confused state of mind. At least we are also clear on that. But yes, uh, I was surprised to find out that uh, there is certain, uh, uh, as in the legal 
the scholars are also not very sure about this concept. In, in fact, one of the articles also suggested that not much debate or not much literature has been, uh, you know, dedicated to this particular aspect. So let me find out more, uh, particularly from the recommendations of International Law Commission. Okay. Okay, so uh, moving on from here today to this part, determination of customary international law uh, with respect to usage, duration, consistency, repetition, and generality. Now, we will deal all of this. First of all, let us understand this very important case, because this case will help us to understand all these different nu nu nuances. Else it will, I'll give you notes, but uh, you won't be able to understand much. And the case is North Sea Continental Shelf case. Are you aware about this case? All of you? Yes, is this the Norway British case uh, where I think the determination of the uh, nay. post is? No, 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 can't recollect as such. Take it. See, uh, from here I'll be dealing case by case because uh, let's understand some of these cases in detail. Let's not worry about time because these cases, as I'm sure you must have seen if you have gone through international law, different subjects, different chapters also, some of these cases do recur. And they recur in a very different circumstances. At times, something else is written about a case. At times, something else is written with respect to, say, state succession or about state. So let's understand this whole concept. Uh, this case uh, deals with or between Germany on one hand and Denmark and Netherlands on other. And the whole issue is determination of continental shelf or how much area with respect to the continental shelf. Now, if you look at the map, I think I have the map for you. Yeah, this is the map. So if you look at the map, uh, can you see this part? This part, not from France, from let's say, let's take it from Netherlands. This, then this then this. Now, do you see this concave part here? This part. Okay. So, this case was with respect to determination of continental shelf. Now, to understand that what is this dispute with respect to determination of continental shelf, it's also important to understand from a very layman perspective, what is a continental shelf and from very layman, or you can say from a geographical perspective and then, and then also from a legal perspective as to what has been written per se under any of the conventions. Now, as you can see, it mentions about here, Geneva, Geneva convention on the continental shelf, 1958. Now, you know that United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea comprises of four different conventions, right? Can you, can you recollect the name of those four? Okay, let's focus on this one. Geneva Convention on the Continental Shelf of 1958. And the ground of dispute was that dispute between Germany and Denmark and Netherlands regarding the method of determining the coastline boundaries along the continental shelf. Now, please uh, look here, this part. So, what they were trying to decipher was that which country will get maximum area. And Germany had certain claim, so had Netherlands, and so had Denmark. Can you highlight the name of the sea? Which sea it is? GS, General Studies. Which sea are we talking about here? Sir, 
the North Sea. So claim of Germany vis-a-vis -vis claim of Denmark <clears throat> and Netherlands. Now Germany, Denmark and Netherlands say that according to the Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf, according to the Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf, according to this, there is an Article 6 of that convention, which stated that this continental shelf or the division of continental shelf, so that this becomes the area of a subjective state's jurisdiction. So this division division or you can say delimitation of continental shelf should be done on the principle of or should be done on equidistant principle. Equidistant from their coastline. Right. But Germany said that if you do this, if you uh, divide the continental shelf based on this equidistant principle from the baseline, then Germany will get very narrow area of continental shelf and more area will be with Denmark and Netherlands. We'll see all of this. Just understand few basic principles here. Whereas Germany refuted or did not agree to this principle laid down in Article 6 of the Geneva Convention of on Continental Shelf. Germany, on the other hand, said that it's better that this division of continental shelf should be done on just and equitable just an equitable share so that all of the different states or all of these sovereign countries get an equal share of continental shelf. This was the first contention of Germany that they did not agree to uh, this equidistant principle. Because according to Germany, if equidistance principle was applied, then the share of continental shelf for Germany will be reduced. So if Germany say that if equidistant principle is applied, then share of continental shelf will reduce for Germany. Now Denmark and Netherlands came up with another contention. The contention was that, that since this Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf was being crystallized or was being, you know, converted into a treaty. So they say that Article 6 simply codifies certain customary practices. So Netherlands, Netherlands and Denmark say that this has been as in this division of continental shelf based on equidistant principle has been done by different states. And what this Geneva Convention did was codifying or crystallizing this customary international practices into a treaty. And since it has been now crystallized into a treaty, hence it is applicable on Germany also. Now, another significant information with respect to this case is that 
both germany and denmark they both signed oh sorry it got deleted anyways now germany and denmark and netherlands germany had signed the treaty but not ratified they had signed and ratified so denmark and netherland said a claim that since germany had already signed the treaty hence all the provisions of the treaty including article 6 of the treaty which provided for equidistant principle for division or delimitation of continental shelf on equidistant principle was was also applicable on germany so the court had to decide that whether this equidistant principle whether this equidistant principle for division of continental shelf whether this was a practice or cust part of customary international law and as we have already seen that to determine whether certain practice is assumed as a part of customary international law both things have to be checked that is actual state practice and also opinio juris any doubt so far the context to the case is clear right yes ma'am germany had signed the treaty but had not ratified the treaty whereas denmark and netherlands have signed and also ratified the treaty so the claim was i am writing down the claims in a very short way whether equidistant principle which is provided under article 6 of geneva convention on continental shelf was part of customary international law first second was germany bound by article 6 of this geneva convention on continental shelf and third to determine that whether even considering that germany had only signed and not ratified so was this equidistant principle based on which division of continental shelf took place was comes the various elements of customary practices was the usage universal or was it prevalent in those times that states agreed that this principle was legally binding on them so obviously to determine whether a certain practice was a part of customary international law or not even prior to the coming into effect of a treaty we have to look into both aspects actual state practice and of course opinio juris and then netherland and denmark also suggested that after so this case continental shelf case uh the judgment came in 1969 and this treaty is of 1958 so netherland and denmark suggested that after coming uh, into effect of this particular treaty 
15 states or 15 different countries had divided their continental shelf and hence it can be said to have certain universal value or a value of repetition also since number of states have been doing so. Now do you understand the claim so far with respect to North Sea continental shelf? All of you? Now to understand this more clearly, we have to understand the very basic meaning of shelf, continental shelf. So let's understand from a very layman perspective or from a geographical perspective about continental shelf. And then let's also see what has been provided under the laws, particularly Article 6. And then, of course, the decision of the ICJ. Now, this case is very important because this case will help us understand many issues pertaining to customary international law. That's why I am dealing this case in so much of detail. Uh, there are other cases also which we will discuss in detail, but this is one of the most important case. Any doubt so far? Man, Sejal Sri, Suraj, Anirudh. All of you are silent today. Okay. Nay? What happened, Man? Okay, 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 okay. Take it. So, uh, just understand that here, what is more most important in this case is this calculation of or division of continental shelf. Basically, there are three states, Germany, Denmark and Netherlands. And uh, this is how the these states are divided along the boundaries close to North Sea. And all of them want that they get the maximum share so that they have their sovereignty ex extended into the territorial waters. Right. Basically, this is the case. So here it says that ground of dispute, dispute between Germany and Denmark and Netherlands on one hand. On the other hand, regarding the method of determining the coastline boundaries along the continental shelf. And this is the map. So, uh, if a question is asked about uh, not, not, the question will not be asked particularly with respect to North Sea continental shelf, but uh, regarding customary law, you can draw a certain map and uh, then you can also highlight this. Okay, uh, first of all, let us understand very briefly about continental shelf. So, uh, I've taken this from Encyclo uh, not National Geographic. Yes, Suraj. Uh, so, could you go back to the previous slide once where uh, you had jotted down those notes? Uh, that slide uh, is not available because That's I had jotted out. Okay. okay. Uh, you can uh, ask me the doubts. Yes, sir. Uh, Usme, there was one portion uh, where you had told that uh, Germany had signed but not ratified the hmm. treaty. Hmm. The hmm. Netherlands and Denmark both had signed and ratified as well. Hmm. So, um, I understood the entire thing, but uh, what was the crux of the uh, case at the end? Like, end me kya hua tha? I lost track of that. We have not concluded the case. I just trying, was trying to highlight about what was the case as such. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, see, uh, the main dispute, Suraj, the main dispute is regarding the method to determine coastline boundaries along continental shelf. So if you can see this, uh, can you see this map? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, so to understand this method of equidistant principle of calculation of continental shelf, just uh, uh, let's understand the meaning of continental shelf. Division ka issue hai, basically. Yahan pe. Yes, sir. And uh, this is Netherlands. So they, they claim, so let's understand this. If this is the, this is Netherlands, let's say this is Germany and this is Denmark, right? So, this is Germany, the concave part.
सो देर इज वन पॉइंट हियर जर्मनी वॉन्ट्स की जो वॉट एवर द डिविजन शुड टेक प्लेस शुड टेक शुड दिस डिविजन पॉइंट शुड बी हियर फार्दर फर्दर मोर फॉर मोर बहुत दूर में जाके सो दैट दे कुड हैव मोर एरिया सपोज दिस इज नेदरलैंड एंड दिस इज जर्मनी देन दे हैव मोर एरिया हियर वेर एज बोथ नेदरलैंड एंड डेनमार्क वॉन्ट दैट दिस थिंग दैट दिस डिविजन पॉइंट शुड नॉट बी फार्दर बट rather here this is as per article 6 of the no no this is the dispute we'll go into everything don't worry i'm just trying to give you the backdrop to the dispute okay sir so if suppose if this is the dispute then we'll have then there is less space for germany here yes sir comparatively mm mm-hmm. uh ye thoda udhar chala gaya suppose uh, if this is the disputed okay suppose this is the place where they want to so this is the place where germany and netherlands want to start the division so here here and here so this is a comparatively lesser area for germany as compared to this area yes sir yahi tha dispute okay theek hai okay. so germany according to germany they wanted the settlement or the division to take place at a at a much farther area much further area but netherland and denmark wanted somewhere here closer in a very layman term i'm telling you in a very very layman term okay sir. so to understand this north sea continental shelf case let us understand very generally very in a very layman Term, what is a continental shelf? You will have more clarity because, and this clarity is important because when we'll start our, you know, chapters with United Nation uh, Convention on the Law of the Seas, various Law of the Seas, there are various these terms, baseline, all these things needs to be understood. And again, here your understanding of geography will also help you in understanding these legal nuances or understanding these legal definitions. So here, thoda sa element of geography is important. Uh, if possible, can all of you switch on your camera? Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Let's wait for some time. This point will be clearer. I am just trying to give you a layman understanding of the term. Okay. so uh before going further let can you is this map visible to all of you this part is continental shelf now this is from a very geographical perspective shoreline coastal plain this is continental shelf continental slope from where there is a downward descent and then of course the sea bed starts now they will, we will keep on referring to these sort of diagrams again and again when we'll start uh, when we'll start our syllabus with respect to the law of the seas because without this uh, it, it will you'll end up cramming thing that's no point let's let's try to understand so it says a continental shelf is the edge of a continent that lies under the ocean so certain area of say a country or some continent lies within the ocean that is the basic part from a very layman perspective again this is not a legal terminology please understand law of the seas explain it in a certain different manner or same thing but with certain legal technicalities so it says obviously continents are the seven main divisions and then it further says that a continental shelf extends from the coastline of a continent to a drop off point called the shelf break from the break shelf descends towards the deep ocean floor in what is called continental slope so this part becomes your continental slope as has been highlighted here theek okay? hai just for your reference just for your understanding it then says that most continental shelves are broad gently sloping plains covered by relatively shallow water so uh, from a general understanding coming to the legal perspective 
this is what the states or different sovereign states try to reclaim or if there are adjacent adjacent states along you know along certain uh, water area then how should they calculate their area or their continental shelf so that their sovereignty extends so far so that they can, basically they can get the maximum amount of uh, area with respect to the sea so it says uh, even though they are under water continental shelves are part of the continent the actual boundary of a continent is not its coastline but the edge of the continental shelf but again uh, this is a very geographical understanding of a continental shelf again i'm repeating this and if you look at this map see here this is your continental shelf and then the continental slope and then of course later theek okay? hai so it says that the graphic shows several ocean floor features on a scale from 0 to 35000 feet below sea level and the following features shown at example depths at scale okay continental shelf 300 feet continental slope from 300 to 10000 feet okay these are the technical details um, let's not go into it but i hope you understand the the problem regarding the claim of germany and all those things but when we'll see this from a legal perspective the definition slightly changes here two more things which you need to understand is about this term territorial sea and one term is baseline so this is sort in a layman term you can understand that an average line taken with respect to the shore or where the continent ends so territorial sea 12 nautical miles from baseline so from so if this is the baseline then from here till 12 nautical miles exclusive economic zone up to 200 nautical miles from baseline so if uh, if this is the exclusive economic zone then from here till here or wherever the baseline is in between there are contiguous zones and then there are high seas now look here continental shelf so that part can be or was claimed so it says that the united nation convention on the law of the sea recognizes three maritime zones the territorial sea the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf again i am saying when we, when we will go through the law of the seas we'll discuss again all of these in slightly more detail but here i have taken this uh, the all these uh, pictures so that you at least understand the you know when you go through any of these cases so at least you understand ki kya tha dispute what was the, what was the dispute actually about is this part clear so as you can see here the extension if suppose this is the land then extension from here till continental shelf and according to united nation convention on the law of the seas there are three maritime zones territorial sea the eez and continental shelf theek hai moving on to the our legal part just go through this part this is article 1 this is article 1 with respect to geneva convention on the continental shelf now see uh, this is a treaty we are talking about right at that point of time this was uh, in 1958 um, this whole convention was tried to be uh, you know codified into this particular treaty and as i've suggested that certain there are certain there are certain elements or of a treaty suppose these are the terms of the treaty i will discuss this again when we'll start discussion about treaty and various provisions with respect to various aspects of treaty accession ratification reservation for the sake of this case let us understand this part now it's possible that every treaty can comprise of let's say some core part and some other parts and did 
depending on the terms of any given treaty could change generally it is seen that reservation is not allowed on core part of the treaty now the question is what is reservation reservation means let's suppose this is a multilateral treaty which is signed by 50 countries or 50 countries agree to abide by the terms of this treaty it may be possible that some country let's say four countries said that we will not agree by these two terms rest is fine simple agreement kabhi kabhi we, we, we say to our friends let's go and watch a movie and the friend says are nahi yaar ye wala nahi wo wala chaloge to chalenge hai na matlab something like that so these four states says that rest of the provisions of the treaty is fine but we will not agree to these terms and the remaining states is fine by it is fine no we don't have any problem here the question is that in this treaty that is in this geneva convention on continental shelf first question is that is reservation allowed under article 6 because article 6 of this treaty talks about the equidistant method to determine the continental shelf question is can germany say no i will not agree to this part of the treaty or could germany had said this another question or another way of asking is that can we say that article 6 of this geneva convention on continental shelf is the core part of the treaty from which derogation is not allowed now icj has answered all these questions yes i will explain i will explain don't worry i will explain reservation clear hai ki some states may say like uh, <clears throat> okay i will not agree to this part of the treaty is this part clear theek hai core part thing okay now i have said that अब कॉन्टिनेंटल शेल्फ पे ट्रीटी है तो कुछ तो एलिमेंटल होगा ना उसमें देर मस्ट बी समथिंग वेरी कोर विद दैट नाउ कैन अ कंट्री से दैट आई एम साइनिंग द ट्रीटी एंड रेटिफाइंग द ट्रीटी बट आई विल ओनली अबाइड बाय टू टू प्रोविजंस ऑफ द ट्रीटी फिर तो साइन ही क्यों कर रहे हो टू टू थ्री थिंग्स आर आइजेज हियर that article 6 of the treaty which talks about this method of determining or delimiting or dividing the continental shelf based on equidistant principle is this a core part of the treaty and if this is a core part of the treaty then can germany say that <clears throat> or is reservation then allowed for germany or germany can germany say that i will not agree to this part of the treaty that is article 6 of this particular treaty these were the questions raised so see i am highlighting all these issues so that whenever you tomorrow also when you go through any book any standard book when all these things are written at least you have a certain clarity that why this point what why this part was written in that book okay icj has said a number of things but for us from an examination perspective let's focus and concentrate on two aspects he did the geneva convention on the continental shelf in a way crystallized a customary international practices into a treaty and if it did crystallize a customary international law into treaty then we are also assuming that that customary international law there were both elements state practices and and states believing that they are legally bound by that practice getting the point or can this treaty have certain provisions from which few states can say theek hai ki baki to theek hai i agree by most of the principles of this treaty but yaar ye wala na chhod do mere ko ye division wala part chhod do isko dekh lenge 
Now the question is that how do we determine whether a provision is core part of the treaty or not? That will depend on the provisions of the treaty itself. Now we will go through Article 1 also. We will go through Article 6 also and we will go through Article 12 also of this particular treaty to make you understand that whether it can be said to be part of the treaty or not. And we will try to decipher also. We will try to analyze also. And then we will follow up by the decision of ICJ. Because I will give you a proper dictation with respect to the decision of ICJ because this is very important. And in case a question is asked and if you highlight these you know, small but subtle nuances that Article 6 mein aisa bola gaya. and hence we conclude this, it value enhances your answer. And if you understand this case, any case with respect to continental shelf will become easy for you to understand later. Have some patience, bear with me for 10-15 more minutes, then we'll come to the uh, actual part of this. Let's go through this part. Article 1 of the Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf. <clears throat> Can you see this on your screen? Article 1. Okay. I think it was a bit slow. Article 1 says for the purpose of these articles, the term continental shelf is used as referring the following A to the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas adjacent to the coast but outside the area of territorial sea to a depth of 200 meters or beyond that limit to where the depth of the supra adjacent waters admits of the exploitation of the natural resources of the said areas to the seabed and subsoil of similar submarine areas adjacent to the coast of islands. Now, this explains about continental shelf in a very technical manner. So, no state can say that we do not abide by this provision of the treaty defining continental shelf. Because this it is here where it explains that continental shelf hai hi kya. This is what we consider continental shelf according to this treaty. To so the seabeds and subsoil of submarine areas, which is submerged to the coast but outside the area of territorial sea this one see uh, so this is article 1 and article 12 talks about reservation so it says at a time of signature ratification or accession so even if germany has signed this treaty this provision of reservation still applies to germany it says that at a time of signature, ratification or accession, any state may make reservation to articles of the convention other than to article 1, 2, 3 inclusive. Look into this term very clearly. It is very straightforward saying that okay, from article 1, 2, 3, you cannot make reservation or you cannot change your understanding. So one Germany cannot say that, okay, I do not agree to the definition given here with respect to article 1. They cannot say or they cannot disagree with the provisions of article 2 and even article 3 as because it says that at a time of signature, ratification and accession, any state may make reservation to articles of the convention other than to article 1, 2, 3 inclusive. But it does not say anything further. So legally speaking, can Germany make a reservation to Article 6 in a general understanding? Yes, this is what ICJ also said. Now let's come to the provision of Article 6 itself. I will make you understand certain key provisions here which will help us to understand whether is it a core part of the treaty itself. Uh, so, yes, uh, so, so article 12 mentions that no party or no, hmm. no member can make a reservation to article one, two, three, hmm. thereby signifying that 
articles one two three are the core part of the treaty. Yes, uh, definitely. However, we we are contemplating that whether Article Six also, although not uh, explicitly mentioned, forms yes. part of the core part of the treaty. Yes, because uh, the whole contention of Netherlands and Denmark was based on this article, Article Six, saying that since a customary international practices has been codified into a form of a treaty, hence this is binding upon all states so this was the claim of denmark and netherlands that since article 6 mentions about the division of continental shelf based on equidistant principle right and hence and also because this customary international law was being codified as part of article 6 hence this is binding on all states whether they have ratified or not Got it, sir. But on the contrary, Germany would argue that had it been a core part of the treaty, then yes. in that case, it would have been put in Article 12. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. Now you're getting the point. Theek hai? Yes, yes. Ab, ab point tak clear hai? So, on one hand, Germany and Nether uh, sorry, Netherlands and Denmark saying that you have to divide the continental shelf based, based on equidistant principle provided in Article 6. But Germany is saying that if you do this, then I will lose substantial share. Understand this part here first. Pele ye yaha samal lo. I'll use what color? I'll use black. So this is Germany. This is Denmark. This is Netherlands. Tell me if I'm wrong. Theek hai? Malab, a general understanding. You see this point C to D and E. So this is what Netherlands and Denmark were saying ki divide aise kar lo. Yahan se kar lo. So now Germany considering this is Germany this. So Germany only have this part now as part of its continental shelf. Theek hai? If E is the division point here. This this is what was claimed why by Denmark and Netherlands. But <clears throat> Germany said make F as your point. So now Germany will have greater area. Clear? This is the claim. Simple claim. And Germany is now saying ki if you do on if you do this division based on Article 6, then it will not be based on equitable grounds. Equity nahi hoga. Nahi equal hoga, nahi equitable hoga. And Germany will stand to lose. Yes, Suraj. So this portion towards the left of point F, that is the continental shelf area of uh, UK? Ha, ha, ha. That happened later when they agreed. Uh, we'll come into that. That is of UK. Definitely. Another uh, thing uh, I wanted to ask is that when it comes to reservation with respect to any particular provision, uh, when a country is signing that treaty, do they need to make reservations clear prior to that or during the course also they can say that we have not had any problem with this before? Uh, I am not yet sure. I will just look into it whether prior may they have to look so, into it. When we will deal with treaty, we will look into that. Don't worry. Sir, I think it's mentioned, uh, yes, sir, I think it's mentioned in article 12 itself that the reservation can be made at the, sign of, at the time of signature. A ratification yes. or, or there was one more provision. So accession. those times uh, a, a reservation can be made. Ha, mm -hmm. malab, uh, see, country can make reservations because only then the other country will either agree or disagree. Obviously. Thik. Ye part clear Germany saying that the division of continental shelf should be based on equitable share of the continental shelf based on the length of the coastline. This division of continental shelf should be in proportion to the length of the coastline. This is what Germany is saying and not according to Article 6, 6 of the Geneva Convention which talks about equidistant method.
So let's go through Article 6 first. What exactly it says? Does it say that equidistant principle has to be followed or does it say that it can be done after an agreement has been reached or not? Let's see. It says that where the same continental shelf is adjacent to the territories of two or more states. So same continental shelf adjacent to territories of two or more states. Perfect example of this one. Same continental, continental shelf, but having two different sovereign territories or sovereign boundaries. Then where the same continental shelf is adjacent to the territories of two or more states whose coasts are opposite each other, the boundary of the continental shelf pertaining to such states shall be determined by agreement between them. This is the first statement. The first statement mentions about that such determination of boundary of continental shelf shall be based on agreement. Only then it mentions about certain method of calculation. It then says, I'll highlight this in blue part, the second part. In the absence of agreement, so the first priority is given to an agreement between two states and two states might agree on a different method of boundary division or division of continental shelf, not, not only equidistant principle. And this is very clear after going through or perusing this particular provision. It then says in the absence of the agreement and unless another boundary line is justified by special circumstances. So this, the whole statement with respect to division of continental shelf based on equidistant principle is qualified by some other provisions also. So it says that in the absence of agreement and unless another boundary line is justified by special circumstances, the boundary is the median line, every point of which is equidistant from the nearest points of the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea of each state is measured. This equidistant met method comes the last point in the absence of an agreement. So there can be an agreement. So two states can agree into an agreement, uh, say having an alternative method of uh, boundary sharing or division of continental shelf. And it then says in the absence of agreement and unless other boundary line is justified by special circumstances, only then it comes at a third point, first agreement, Second, in the absence of agreement, only if it is justified and then third. You're understanding this. So going through this provision, can we say that yes, Germany can claim that equidistant principle is not the first and foremost principle as highlighted in article six. And this is exactly what was claimed by Germany. Now, another drafting history with respect to this convention was, <clears throat> I think it was also highlighted by ILC, International Law Commission, that the, <clears throat> the members of the convention were, were not very sure of, you know, uh, making or drafting this particular provision in a certain manner. And that's why they have provided all these qualifications with respect to the equidistant principle. So they were also not sure. And hence ICJ noted that since they were not sure with respect to drafting of this provision, hence it can be definitely said that the, the state practice was not universally accepted among all states. If state practice was universally accepted among all states, it would have easily shown in the provisions of the, this particular treaty. Since that was not so, and since state practice was not universal or acceptable norm among most of the states, hence there was no opinion juris also. State practice is uniform, non-uniform, not universal. And since it's not uniform, it means other states or all the states do not agree to only one method of dividing continental shelf in whatever way they like. Right. It then says that where the same continental shelf is adjacent to the territories of two adjacent states, particular case for Germany here. Because on one hand, there is Denmark. On the other hand, there is Netherlands. Where the same continental shelf is adjacent to the territories of two adjacent states, the boundary of the continental shelf shall be determined by 
agreement between them again it is again mentioning about agreement not pre qualifying or not pre qualified by the equidistant principle it again says that that for such a situation classical situation for germany netherlands and denmark the boundary of the agreements in the absence of the agreement and unless another boundary line is justified by special circumstances the boundary shall be determined by application of the principle of equidistance from the nearest points of baselines from which the breadth of territorial sea of each state is measured this is exactly what icj also noted what we are trying to understand by simply going through going through the provision of this treaty so i'll share this slide with you don't worry okay <clears throat> so question before the icj is germany under a legal obligation to accept the equidistant special circumstances principle contained in article 6 of geneva convention on the continental shelf of 1958 either as a customary international rule or as the basis of geneva convention claim is very simple ya to customary law ke hisab matlab claim of netherland and denmark was very simple that germany should accept the equidistant principle of sharing of or division of continental shelf either as a part of treaty rule either or part of customary international practices another question here which arose was that did this treaty or did this convention gave rise to a gave rise to a subsequent customary international practice with respect to equidistant principle that answer was also answered in this was also refuted by icj कि नहीं ऐसा कुछ नहीं सो द क्रक्स हियर इज दैट यस अ ट्रीटी आफ्टर कमिंग इनटू इफेक्ट कैन गिव राइज टू एनी कस्टमरी इंटरनेशनल प्रैक्टिसेस बाय डिफरेंट स्टेट्स इफ दो प्रैक्टिसेस आर यूनिवर्सल दो प्रैक्टिसेस आर एक्सेप्टेड बाय द स्टेट्स एंड दो प्रैक्टिसेस आर बिलीव्ड बाय द स्टेट्स टू बी लीगली बाउंडिंग सो ट्रीटी भी कर सकता है ट्रीटी coming into effect of a treaty for example uh uh sorry treaty kar sakta hai and duration also matters but duration does not always matter for example there can be a possibility or uh, for example international <coughs> space time uh, or <coughs> international law with respect to space time or international aviation law or let's say tomorrow if a new international agreement is reached with respect to artificial intelligence now because of the fast nature of these developments duration is not necessarily always a criteria to determine customary international practices and the next question was article 6 of the geneva convention stated that unless the parties had already agreed on a method for delimitation or unless special circumstances exist the equal distance method would apply so this was the whole situation in this case again the same thing this f point e point e point claimed by denmark and netherland f point claimed by germany so claim of germany very simply that maritime boundary line should be proportional to the length of each state's coastline and hence continental shelf must be divided equally among all states because according to germany by applying the equidistance method of article 6 it the sharing will not be equal i think this is uh, based on article 6 so is this part clear that what was the the whole issue all about so please write down the 
decisions of ICJ. Just write down and we'll discuss each one one by one. Now, uh, Netherlands claimed that although Germany had not ratified Geneva Convention, yet it was bound to delimit continental shelf or divide continental shelf by equidistance method because it was rule of customary international law. Okay. So, on both those cases, so, uh, right. On examination of Article 6 of Geneva Convention, on examination of Article 6 of Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf, on examination of Article 6, 6 of Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf, the court said. The court said that for a customary rule to emerge, following must be needed. The court said that for a customary rule to emerge, following must be needed. First, very widespread and representative participation. Very widespread and representative participation in the convention. Very widespread and representative participation in the convention, including states, including states whose interests were specifically affected. including states whose interests were specifically affected. Second, I'll repeat this first point again. Very widespread and representative participation in the convention, including states whose interests were specifically affected. Second, virtual uniform practice Virtual uniform practice, which is consistent, virtual uniform practice, which is consistent and undertaken in a manner, virtual uniform practice, which is consistent and undertaken in a manner. Virtual uniform practice, which is consistent and undertaken in a manner that demonstrates general recognition of the rule of law. That demonstrates general recognition of the rule of law or legal obligation. That is opinio juris. Now on, the, now on the aspect of duration, the court highlighted on the aspect of duration, on the aspect of duration, the court further held the court further held that duration taken for a customary rule to emerge. The court further held that duration taken for a customary rule to emerge is not as important as widespread. The court further held that duration taken for a customary rule to emerge is not as important as 
वाइड स्प्रेड एंड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव पार्टिसिपेशन एज वाइड स्प्रेड एंड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव पार्टिसिपेशन कॉमा यूनिफॉर्म यूसेज एंड द एग्जिस्टेंस ऑफ एन ओपिनियो जूरिस एज वाइड स्प्रेड एंड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव पार्टिसिपेशन कॉमा यूनिफॉर्म यूसेज एंड द एग्जिस्टेंस ऑफ एन ओपिनियो जूरिस प्लीज अंडरलाइन दीज टर्म फ्रॉम वाइड स्प्रेड टिल ओपिनियो जूरिस सो वाइड स्प्रेड एंड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव रिप्रेजेंटेटिव पार्टिसिपेशन Now, when we say widespread and representative participation, it also signifies that most states agree to such a principle. है ना कह सकते हैं ना I repeat this statement again on the issue of duration. The court further held that duration taken for a customary rule to emerge is not as important as widespread and representative participation. comma uniform usage and the existence of an opinion jurist so it was on this point icj negated the argument forwarded by netherland and denmark on the fact that since neither uh, netherland and denmark claimed that after the uh, this particular treaty coming into effect or convention coming into effect 15 states had ratified or agreed to uh, follow the equidistance principle for dividing content into shelf as per article 6 so they said that even if you do not consider it part of customary international practice which was crystallized through this particular treaty still after this particular treaty coming into effect 15 states have followed this principles hence germany hence this principle is having a legally binding effect since it's a part of the treaty and that's why it's also binding on germany court did not agree to this and talking about the duration they did not consider duration as important as compared to other aspects of customary international law with respect to widespread and representative participation uniform usage and existence of opinio juris so widespread participation obviously it means that most states are doing same thing in the same manner uniform usage means there is hardly any deviation from the said thing and existence of an opinio juris obviously you understand that states not only they are following the state practice but they are also believing that if they do not do so it will result in breach of customary international law but this was this cannot be said to be the case with respect to equal distance method as provided under article 6 this was the claim of icj on opinio juris the next aspect is on opinio juris on opinio juris icj examined on the issue of opinio juris the court examined 15 cases the court examined 15 cases where states had delimited their boundaries where states had delimited their boundaries the court examined 15 cases where states had delimited their boundaries using the equidistance met using the equidistant method using the equidistant method after the convention came into force after the convention came into force the court concluded the court concluded that even if there were some state practices the court concluded the court concluded that even if there were some state practices in favor of equidistant principle the court concluded that even if there were some state practices in favor of equidistant principle the court could not deduct the opinio juris from this state practice the court could not deduct opinio juris from this state practice the court could not deduct opinio juris from this state practice thus 
I'll repeat this again on the issue of opinion juris. The court examined 15 cases where states had delimited their boundaries using the equidistant method after the convention came into force. The court concluded that even if there were some state practices in favor of equidistant principle, the court could not deduct the opinion juris from the state practices. Next point. Thus, comma, the North Sea Continental Shelf case confirmed. Thus, comma, the North Sea Continental Shelf case confirmed that Thus, the North Sea Continental Shelf case confirmed that both state practice that both state practice under bracket this in bracket the subjective element Thus, comma, the North Sea Continental Shelf case confirmed that both state practice, bracket, the objective element and opinio juris, bracket, subjective element are essential prerequisites, are essential prerequisites for the formation of customary rule of law. For the formation of customary rule of law. Thus, comma, the North Sea Continental Shelf case confirmed that both state practice, that is objective element and opinio juris, that is subjective element, are essential prerequisites for the formation of customary rule of law. And this is consistent with Article 38.1b of Statute of ICJ. And this is consistent with Article 38.1b of Statute of ICJ. And this is consistent with Article 38.1b of Statute of ICJ. So the, so the ICJ concluded So the ICJ concluded that equidistance method. So the ICJ concluded that equidistant method was not binding on Germany. So the court concluded or the ICJ concluded that equidistant method was not binding on Germany by way of treaty or customary international law. By way of treaty or customary international law. Thus, sorry, further, thus the court concluded that the equidistance method was not binding on Germany by way of treaty or customary international law. Next point, further, Further, the equidistant principle. Further, the equidistant principle. Cannot be considered as part of customary international law. Cannot be considered as part of customary international law. The further, the equidistant principle cannot be considered as a part of customary international law as at the time of entry into force, as at the time of entry into force of the Geneva Convention, as at the time of entry into force of the Geneva Convention or thereafter, comma, the principle had not attained the status of customary international law. The principle, the principle had not attained the status of customary international law. I'll repeat the sentence again. 
Further, the equidistance principle cannot be considered as part of customary international law as at the time of entry into force of the Geneva Convention or thereafter, comma, the principle had not attained the status of customary international law. Thus, last point, thus, thus the equidistant principle Thus, the equidistant principle was not obligatory for Germany Thus, the equidistant principle was not obligatory for Germany for delimitation of continental shelf. Another line uh, with respect to use of equidistance method. Uh, same thing, just write this down. Uh, it will help you in answer writing. The use of equidistant method. ICJ held that use of equidistant method had not crystallized. The use of equidistant method had not crystallized into customary law. The use of equidistant method had not crystallized into customary law and the method was not obligatory for delimitation of areas in the North Sea. And the method was not obligatory for the delimitation of areas in the North Sea. So could you repeat this line again? Yes. The use of equidistant method had not crystallized into customary law. Same thing, but in a different format. Because uh, we discussed about whether uh, uh, whether this particular convention crystallized or code resulted in codification of certain customary international practices. So on this, ICJ said that use of equidistant method had not crystallized into customary law and the method was not obligatory for the delimitation of areas in North Sea. And the method was not obligatory for the delimitation of the areas in North Sea. Uh, so, hmm. uh, yes, uh, so uh, did the court make any comment as to when does a treaty get binding? Is it after the signature or is it after the ratification? See, uh, as such, nothing uh, outrightly has been written. It is assumed generally. But once a treaty is also signed, generally saying, it is also assumed to be binding by some states. But again, the issue is not whether it is binding in whole or not. Again, the issue comes as to reservation. Did Germany objected to certain rule of that particular treaty? So uh, can just uh, uh, sir, but this would again uh, like the whole pretext of so much importance is given to ratification would lose its relevance if the treaty were to become binding just after signing. Like then what is even the point of ratification if a treaty is becoming binding? Like point if... of ratification will differ according to different domestic laws. Here, municipal law will come into effect then. Uh, so, if... like, like it is said that signing of a treaty is hmm. the uh, executive intent. The okay. yes. executive is showing its intent that absolutely yes, going through. Whereas ratification is the legislative intent. Yes, absolutely. Ratic See, uh, when we talk, when we talk, let's talk technically or legally. Okay? Ratifi ratification ke baat ta, you cannot derogate from any provision of the treaty unless until you have specifically said, okay, we have reservation on this, this, this. Okay? Uh, yes, sir. So that is why, uh, like my question is that is it safe to say that like there is sufficient ground for a country to say that 
boss we had not ratified the treaty as yet so we have all the reasons to not abide by the treaty unless it is a custom like it has been done hmm. in this case. unless it can be proved that 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 practice is a part of customary international exactly. practice exactly yes. exactly that Definitely. that was the whole bone of contention and why custom came into the fore in this case Uh, we'll look into it when we'll go through signature and ratification of treaty. Carrying it, we'll go through each of these when we'll start with treaty. Okay. Right. Right. Abhi, see, as of now, I am just we are just looking into this based on this particular case. Treaty is a separate chapter altogether because we have to go through every provision of VCLT. Then, sure, sir. Sure, sir. I understand that right you, now. You are getting the point. Even in the light of customary international law. Yes, this is see. This is another important uh, subtopic, as you can say, of customary international law. That can a customary international practice can also be derived from certain treaty. होता है ना कि बिल्कुल पहले treaty आ गया फिर practices शुरू शुरू हो गए. So can we also say that? So that can also happen. Again, it's not. The question is not a custom precedes a treaty or a treaty precedes a custom. To prove that if there is a customary international practices which is considered legally binding, again we refer back to the two things: actual state practices and opinion juris. But this case gave certain example with respect to widespread widespread usage, uniformity in terms of usage, and it also mentioned about uh, three terms: whether virtual uniform practice. so there is very less deviation from that practice widespread usage and the states believe that they are legally bound again the aspect of opinion jury so we are coming back to the same two things which we were studying earlier also with respect to customary international practices but can a customary international practice originate or you know emanate from any treaty the answer is yes but again that will depend on those two basic facts so uh i know i am touching on certain aspects of treaty here but uh let's abhi wait karte hain tomorrow from tomorrow onwards after completing the general principles of law uh we'll start with extensively with treaty because treaty uh, when we talk about treaty the number of terms which we have to go through as i've said you mentioned today right now wahan pe likha tha na uh, signature ratification accession we have already uh, understood about acquisitions in customary international law right similarly there are various other terms also with respect to treaty okay ye case clear hai is case mein koi doubt hai any doubt in this case so far ओके लास्ट पॉइंट एक एक और पॉइंट है दिस इज द कंक्लूजन ऑन पार्ट ऑफ आई सीरियस जस्ट राइट दीज टू पॉइंट सो रादर देन फॉलोइंग द इक्वी डिस्टेंट मेथड एज हाईलाइटेड इन एज पर आर्टिकल सिक्स ऑफ द जिनिवा कन्वेंशन इंस्टेड ऑफ फॉलोइंग आर्टिकल सिक्स इंस्टेड ऑफ फॉलोइंग आर्टिकल सिक्स ऑफ जिनिवा कन्वेंशन विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू इक्वी डिस्टेंट मेथड ICJ proposed. ICJ proposed that delimitation should be done. ICJ proposed that delimitation should be done on the basis of equitable principle. taking multiple factors into account instead icj proposed that delimitation should be done on the basis of equitable principle taking multiple factors into account to ensure to ensure that each state was granted to ensure that each state was granted a fair portion of the contested claim to ensure that each state was granted a 
a fair portion of the contested claim. So this is the whole idea here. There is reason, there is equity, there is rationality, not only based on certain principle, because according to Germany, by applying this principle, this fairness in terms of division was being hampered. And following ICJ's ruling, and following ICJ's ruling, and following ICJ's ruling, Germany signed agreements. And following ICJ's ruling, Germany signed agreements with both Denmark and Netherlands. And following ICJ's ruling, Germany signed agreements with both Denmark and Netherlands, resolving their continental shelf dispute, resolving their continental shelf dispute in January 1971. <laughs> and interestingly, after signing of this agreement, the uh, even UK had to readjust their continental shelf. <laughs> this is what you were asking Suraj, right? Earlier? Yes, sir. So UK, pe, uh, okay, because of the point ENF. Achha, yeah, let's come back there. Let's come back to this. I'm removing all. So, Okay. Yeah, pe. Kuch division hua tha is maybe. Hmm. This part. So there was some adjustment made, I think, later after this agreement. So yes, UK was also involved. Is this case clear? Now similar is the Anglo. Norwegian, Norwegian fisheries case. Just write this down. Anglo Norwegian fisheries case. Just write this part. UK, that is United Kingdom, argued against the method of measuring. UK argued against the method of measuring breadth of the territorial sea. UK argued UK argued against the method of measuring breadth of the territorial sea which was alleged which was alleged by Norway So this was a case between UK and Norway, which was alleged by Norway as a customary method, which was alleged by Norway as a customary method of measurement. UK argued against the method of measuring breadth of territorial sea, which was alleged by Norway as a customary method of measurement, whereby, 
whereby a straight line can be drawn whereby a straight line may be drawn across base a straight line may be drawn across base of less than I think it's 10 miles of less than 10 miles whereby a straight line may be drawn across base of less than 10 miles from one projection to another. So if from one projection to another, if the distance is less than 10 miles, then this is how it can be calculated by drawing a straight line across the bay. So UK did not agree to this and contested this claim of Norway. I'm repeating this state, uh, sentence again. UK argued against the method of measuring breadth of territorial sea, which was alleged by Norway as a customary method of measurement, whereby a straight line may be drawn across base of less than 10 miles from one projection to another, which could then be regarded as the baseline for the measurement of territorial sea, which could, which could be, which could then be regarded as the baseline. So this straight line drawn between two bays of less than 10 miles will be regarded as baseline. This was the contention of Norway, which could then be regarded as the baseline for the measurement of territorial C. Full stop. The ICJ emphasized the ICJ. The ICJ emphasized that some degree of uniformity that some degree of uniformity the ICJ emphasized that some degree of uniformity among state practices was essential the ICJ emphasized that some degree of uniformity among state practices was essential before a custom could come into existence. Same aspects. The ICJ emphasized that some degree of uniformity among state practices was, was essential before a custom could come into existence. Okay. So is this part clear so far? Right. I hope uh, you will be able to attempt most of the questions. We'll discuss other case laws tomorrow and then uh, we'll try to, I'll try to complete the general principles of law. I'll not start it right now. It's already three. And then, uh, then thereafter we'll start with treaty. Uh, I think uh, thoda, some part we have already started with treaty, but we'll start with the basics of treaty. Uh, just to give you some fodder, fodder of thought regarding treaty, just go through uh, the first provisions, the first few provisions with respect to VCLT. I'll tell you exactly which one and uh, from tomorrow onwards, since we'll be discussing about treaty, keep the VCLT handy, either the print or an online format. The Vienna convention on the law of treaties, 1969. Is there any other, other Vienna convention on the law of treaty? You're welcome, man. See. I'm telling you again and again, I want to discuss case law separately. I don't want to discuss anything now. I know. Aaj absorb kar lo thoda. We'll take up another case, probably Lotus case or uh, one or two more cases. Just know the nuance of the case. Just know the details of the case. Trust me, you don't have to remember anything at all. You don't have to mug up things. That's my guarantee. And then uh, when we'll discuss other chapters, na, things uh, are clear. Hote chali Abhi to, it's just a start. We have just, this is the eighth class. International law will consume some of some or much of our time. And let's give international law its due respect. At least one law, which is not ours. I can definitely say this. IPC is ours. Contract is ours. Constitution, Purai par liyo, I'm sure. We uh, study constitution much when we study about uh, polity and governance. 
uh, yet the approach is slightly different for law because the answer writing part differs. Uh, there is no difference in understanding when we uh, you know deal with constitutional law. No difference at all. What only adds up in constitutional law is the administrative part as or rather the administrative legal part, legal administrative law and certain constitutional philosophies. Thoda sa wo add hota hai. Along with the constitutional debates. It's not that we have to study constitutional debates. Alag se nahi. When we discuss about a topic, say federalism, we'll, we'll go into the backdrop. We'll go into the history. We'll go into the cases. We'll go into the minority judgments also. Talking about minority judgment, this judgment, uh, North Sea Continental Shelf, uh, there was one minority judgment here. And uh, I think that Justice Latch or something, I'm just forgetting his name. Justice Latch gave... Uh, he said that, or he observed that, no, no, uh, there is an opinion juris because uh, since again he, his ideology was more from a positivist mindset. I can say, he said that since it's a part of the treaty, and and treaty has been signed or ratified or accepted by the member states, hence it is binding. And since they have signed, so they believe that all the provisions or the provisions of the treaties are legally binding. So this is what he believed. But here, I don't think that part is necessary. But just to tell you that here also the decisions are like uh, four is to one or something. <laughs> so, man, you are now thinking like a positivist. Would you, so far we have discussed um, so much in jurisprudence. What do you think? You uh, believe more in natural law or positive law? Uh, sir, I believe in a very hybrid format because I, I feel that natural law has to be there be be without natural law some tenets which should be universally recognized uh, it would really be chaotic because <laughs> like if we, if we see through the history there have been uh, there have been like even if we see manusmriti and all those things which we see they were not very very moral per se so natural law is very important but the more it is written down, the more it is posited, the better it is. So that there is less conflict. See this, man, just understand this. I think today this verdict is also about to come on same-sex marriage or has it been pronounced? Any idea? It's been pronounced, uh, sir. It's been pronounced. Pronounced? Kya bola yes. bhai? So three, two, uh, they have said that marriage is not allowed. But, marriage uh, is not allowed. Okay. No, sir. Institution of marriage is not allowed. This is important. We have to understand this from... Uh, you know, very different perspective, legal perspective from sociological perspective, rights perspective, and what else? And sir, yeah. but uh, I think they have given directions to the central government to mull over the rights of uh, people, especially the civil rights. For example, can they form yeah. consensual unions, then adoption? Yes, yes. because uh, yeah. if you have gone through, uh, I made a video also on the same-sex marriage and I raised certain legal issues. That it's not only marriage, the many things, many associated things from marriage that will arise. So this is what I was saying that, see, uh, man, you rightly said that, you know, we are living in a very changed society or a society where many things are changing. World order is changing. I'm sure you all are, we all are witnessing it. Uh, morals are changing. Uh, science, advancement in science and technology is changing. Somewhere yesterday, I was reading somewhere something that uh, next year is the 24 uh, Olympics, right? In Paris. And we have also uh, claimed that 2036 Olympics will be in India. Let's hope that happens. So uh, somewhere I read that 2024 Olympics will be the last Olympics prior to the AI age. I was surprised to read this. I was like, Achha, itna jaldi. So many things are changing. And that along with these change, these technological change, sociological change, whatever, historical change, change with respect to political powers, international relations, the morals of the society also changes. So, uh, you know, you rightly said it's a hybrid thing. We have to understand, yes, there has to be a sovereign authority. There has to be uh, any commanding authority who will make legislation, who will execute them. And there will be an adjudicatory body in the name of judiciary. But at the same time, we do have to follow certain moral principles. And some of the moral principles should become part of the legal principles. I think we will see some of them in when we'll deal with IPC also. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. A hybrid model is the best way forward. As also suggested by Fuller with respect to Hart-Fuller debate. I'm sure you must, you must know that. Okay. So, uh, any doubts so far in today's lecture? Uh, so, so, what did you advise regarding what we have to read? Like what provisions of ECLT? 
अच्छा हाँ गो थ्रू गो थ्रू द फर्स्ट पार्ट द स्टेट पार्ट टू द प्रेजेंट कन्वेंशन कंसिडरिंग सो एंड सो गो थ्रू आर्टिकल वन Just go through Article One. Nothing much. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll uh, see. We need not as in, learn is there, but let's understand that why certain elements or certain provisions of ACLT is important. Uh, if time permits, I will go through the ILC uh, recommendations on use cogens and try to figure out the difference with erga omnis, if at all there is any. Okay, uh, that thing uh, that is a very interesting aspect. I will go through that and. Uh, so uh if you can open up just one the first part article sorry article 2 article 1 just go through article 1 if you all can and it says that the present convention applies to treaties between states can you see all of you VCLT Article One, Article One and Two. If it applies to only treaties between states, what about treaties between international organizations? Or can or are international organizations at all allowed to enter into treaty? Can an individual enter into a treaty? First question. Second question. Article Two. it says treaty means an international agreement concluded between states in written form and governed by international law whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments and whatever its particular designation is can verbal agreement form part of treaty so all these questions arises when we discuss about treaty so we'll look into uh, you know basic understanding of treaty certain important terms Associated with treaty, so uh, but prior to that, let's go through two or three more case laws because all these cases, these cases will come again and again and again. You can cite all of them, but a thorough and a conceptual understanding of these cases is important according to me, and this will help you in writing your answer also. Even if you do not remember, I hope whatever we studied today with respect to North Sea Continental Shelf and the equidistance principle, at least you'll be able to write something. and not something a value value enhanced answer a value enriched answer you will quote article 6 you will quote principle of equitable sharing you can even draw a map if you remember that at least a rough map that bhai denmark bol raha tha e wala point germany bol raha tha f wala point ya yeah, aage wala point so they were claiming more germany was saying that based on the equidistant principle um, equal sharing nahi hoga very strange thing but true and icj also in a way confirmed that yes equidistant principle is not necessarily binding also the provisions were made with respect to reservation citing article 1 2 and 3 so all these makes your answer more nuanced more qualitative right okay then tomorrow uh, we'll try to cover up these important cases and then we'll cover general principles of law and if time permits we'll start with treaty so tomorrow is wednesday we'll try to finish up treaty by at least by this week if if not then i'll not rush into it because this part is important customs and treaty is important and before going further as in uh, before leaving today let's let's go through the questions once more um uh, Use cogens. Okay, we'll uh, we'll refer to this. Uh, I'll give you a short notes on use cogens. We'll discuss use cogens just separately uh, as a part of VCLT. When we'll discuss VCLT, I'll discuss use cogens. Use cogens are along with erga omnes. I'll discuss that. Discuss the constituent elements of an international rule of customary law with the help of cases. So at least today, uh, with the help of these cases, at least you can cite these two cases. discuss whether the trend of convention providing a special clause prohibiting all kinds of reservations or some specific or special kind of reservation or prohibiting reservation totally will hinder the growth of international law uh, let's discuss reservation first under international law then we'll take up this topic 
the substance of customary law must be looked into mainly natural practice and opinion juris of states in light of the above statement and by referring to a case law explain the interplay between objective and subjective elements in acceptance of a particular custom as a source of international law uh, it was asked way back in 2013 but now you can highlight about the north sea continental shelf case here and regarding the objective and subjective elements so these are the objective and subjective elements uh, objective or material elements of the practice of states and the subjective test or psychological element is the opinion jury states believing that they are legally bound by certain practices now here importantly it says that it is the material element that is this one that is significant in the establishment of a customary rule but where the state practice is not uniform or ambiguous then the psychological element gains more weightage so uh, talking about weightage generally the state practices are given more weightage while determining whether uh, any state practice is a part of customary international law but it's not that opinion juris is not given any weightage but in but where the practice is not uniform or not very widespread then definitely opinion juris is or the psychological element is definitely given more consideration in such cases uh, sir exactly what is written in the last statement uh, sir i believe yesterday anirudhan you were having a discussion on this regard that amongst uh, actual state practices and uh, opinion juris yeah. should be given more importance mm -hmm. and Uh, th there was a tendency from the side of anirudh to probably say that opinion jurist should be given more importance <laughs> however at that point in time i also felt that state practices which are actually and physically visible should be given more importance See, generally that... yes you are right generally state practices are given but again this again this statement i cannot make a very you know unilateral statement or very qualified statement ki nahi state practice ko hi diya jayega uh, sir i, I, I that... said yesterday also it will again depend on certain circumstances of the case uh, sir sir i believe that the last line makes it very clear that like if in this if it is very universal mm -hmm. in that case yeah. the actual practices should suffice however in cases with this ambiguity in those cases opinion jury should be also duly considered this makes a lot of sense see you can use this statement as a part of your uh answer also as in sorry as a part of your conclusion also this part in case a question is asked agar weightage pe puchta hai aise shouldn't ask but still in case because if you are talking about weightage we are going we are going actually too far into state practice and also opinion juris but we can never trust upsc so let's be prepared in case it is asked then this can be a suitable conclusion for you all. i hope you agree agree with this right right so i do agree because sir, even in the case of indian penal code which we see so mm -hmm. uh, the actus reus in mm -hmm. reality is the biggest evidence of mens reus in, in many cases yeah. for example if a person has throbbed a person 10 times it, it it manifests so clear intent on the part of the other person that he wanted to kill that person whereas in an example where a person just slapped another person on his head and that that person died it shows to the contrary that may not there may not have been an intent so the act the action does play the predominant role in more cases uh, uh man talking about ipc waha pe uh, har every game has its own own set of rules i uh, you agree with this right so when you talk about ipc i do uh, yeah so when you talk about ipc and particularly offense Uh, which has been defined under ipc of course so it has again uh, actus reus and it has mens rea right so what we are trying to do is that we are trying to compare this with actus reus at state practice and through this opinio juris fine but please remember when we talk about actus reus at there एक्ट कम्स लेटर यहां पे एक्ट पहले हो रहा है फर्क समझ में आ रहा है आई डू अप्रिशिएट दैट माय एनालॉजी इज वेरी लाइक इट्स नॉट नो नो योर एनालॉजी इज एक्चुअली करेक्ट आई एम आई एम एक्चुअली मेकिंग यू अंडरस्टैंड दैट यू आर राइट बट आल्सो ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस न्यूएंस डिफरेंस अनदर इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट मेंस रिया हियर देन मेंस रिया विल डिपेंड ऑन थ्री थिंग्स 
intention the highest degree what did you intend to do you intend to murder or you intend to commit an offense how how do you intend to i intend to murder by pulling six bullets or i wanted to uh, you know pull the trigger six times on other hand i am saying that nahi nahi i only intended to you know throw a rock on him or throw a brick on him so again here with respect to intention the degree varies let's not go much deeper into ipc then the second part is reason to believe not talking strictly according to the definition sorry third part is knowledge second part is knowledge and third part is reason to believe and these these mental elements or psychological elements give rise to certain action and if any of the action with respect to any mental element if such action can be categorized under any of the provision of ipc as an offense then that is illegal or not allowed or punishable right right huh? so i absolutely concur with you with your view so actually my point of saying this was that intention always comes before the act however while deciphering the intent the action is seen ha huh, absolutely right. absolutely absolutely bhai kyu murder kiya yes yes so because because mental element to kisi ka likha nahi kisi ke samne तो आप उसके एक्शन के थ्रू उसका मेंटल एलिमेंट जज करने की कोशिश करते हैं वॉट यू आर एक्चुअली सेइंग वाज नॉट अगेन आई आई एम सेइंग आई एम वेरी आई एम सेइंग वेरी टेक्निकली व्हाट यू आर मेंशनिंग वाज नॉट इवन दिस यू आर मेंशनिंग अबाउट सम अदर थिंग दिस है ना यस इन सर्टेन सेंस एट लीस्ट आई आई एम हैप्पी दैट यू आर एबल टू एट लीस्ट डिफरेंशिएट हियर actual state practice and this that too continued yes yes or repetitive widespread that is it is done by many people or many states uniform there is there is uniformity in terms of the practice or very less deviation then definitely state practice and this continued practice white state uniformity in certain way helps to create a sort of legally you know certain legal binding or in legal binding impact which we referred here which we refer here as opinio juris karte 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 but rarely you will see that just because of opinio juris people started practicing and that is can be considered as part of customary international law may take place through a treaty possible but generally generally if you are talking about whether a customary practice could be considered as legally binding under international law then it always starts with state practice right never with the intention ki nahi karna hi hai tab to fir treaty ho gaya ya koi obligations ho gaya maybe some obligation or something which is binding under under the law yes but sir cust actually... customary practices is never binding and yes, states, states never do because they think they are binding they do because of certain uniformity uniformity certain you know continuity because yes. this is what has been done sir so, actually waisi cheez hogi na agar ek group hai 10 logo ka isme 8 log koi action kar rahe hain to 9th ko feel hoga ki yaar ye to mere ko bhi karna hi hai matlab it is it is bound on me sort of a herd mentality also you can say yeah. yes 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 sir yes sir theek hai chalo thank you sir uh, let's wrap up the class today hai you na know? i hope you understood Yes, yes, Whatever we discuss today. Yes, sir. I hope international law boring नहीं लग रहा अभी. No, sir. मुझे कॉलेज में बहुत बोरिंग लगता था. So हमारा तो सर it happened during COVID days तो सिर्फ प्रोजेक्ट दे दिए थे. मतलब हुआ ही नहीं सब्जेक्ट सर. तो मेरे लिए तो it is like doing it for the first time. So I am finding it very okay. interesting. Okay. Actually, okay. sir, our teacher makes a lot of difference, sir. So. <laughs> probably because of that i am enjoying the subject so yeah same here i thought ki matlab whenever i used to study i thought ki yaar aadhi cheez kyun batate ho puri batani chahiye so i always thought ki law was you know the problem with law i'm talking about law schools generally it happens ki ab bahut mechanical aspect padha diya jata hai uske piche ka 
whatever the element is or why that is thing why that thing is happening at times that makes the makes a subtle difference although knowledge mein koi fark nahi aata but understanding or you know the the way in which we conceptualize a particular topic that differs through so it experience. makes a massive difference so so likewise i can also say this for other subjects like like history i have studied in school and while i was preparing for clat and for gs for upsc uh-huh. civil services i came i came across good teachers so my perspective about history also changed so so same history, goes for all history all is a wonderful subject and you know without understanding any history no culture could be understood nothing could be understood if we do not understand our own constitutional history let's say in that sense if you are not able to understand our constitutional history and to understand our constitutional history it's not it's not a mechanical aspect we have to understand history from a very uh, you know uh, if we if i quote from romila thapar from a very subaltern perspective from a very ground perspective ki bhai society kaisa tha how was our society why this thing happened at that point of time what was the economic status what was the sociological status what was the legal how was the legal apparatus so everything's come everything all combines together and then if you are able to you know understand that thing from a wholesome perspective then it yes. gives us certain uh, uh, rather a better clarity in that sense definitely yes. so ye to so hamare education system mein bhi hai ki a lot of importance is given ki ki kaun se professor ne kitne academic papers publish kare hain kitne journals mein unke yeah. naam hai bhai usse thodi na important hai ki wo samne wale ko acche se samjha bhi payega yeah. kuch teachers aise bhi ho sakte hain who may not boast of all these things but still they are very able to make the student understand what what it really is absolutely i i i totally uh, concur and agree with you and i felt the same when i was doing my masters in law school bangalore so at that point i also understood i realized ki jaise we were studying international trade law theek hai to ab sab pad liya gat pad liya gats pad liya sab kuch pad liya case pad liya everything but the perspective was missing the back backdrop was missing yes yes so yes. i thought ki uh, matlab certain things could change matlab we are studying law from a very mechanical perspective yes yes so sir. wo thoda sa मतलब लाइवलीनेस जरूरी है आई नो मैकेनिकल है आई आई अग्री इट्स अ इंटरनेशनल लॉ इज अ वेरी ड्राई सब्जेक्ट आई टोटली अग्री बट स्टिल इफ अगेन आवर ऑब्जेक्टिव इज टू क्लियर द एग्जाम हियर नथिंग मोर मतलब नॉट एन आउंस मोर बट स्टिल वाइल क्लियरिंग द एग्जाम कैन वी स्टडी इट इन अ सर्टेन डिफरेंट मैनर दैट इज द होल आइडिया व्हिच इज व्हिच इज बेटर फॉर अस ओनली नॉट फॉर एनीवन एल्स ओके देन चलो सी यू टुमारो विल ट्राई टू रैप अप दिस Uh, customary international law is taking lot of time but it's good it is taking time because this will give the platform for us to go into treaties not understanding treaties will be slightly better because uh, this opinio juris and state practices uh, these are not very uh, very straight jacket formula or very straight jacket approach to understand these are very nuanced topics needs lot of clarity not lot of time and also understanding of various cases to uh, go through different aspects 